Um, so hi everybody who's here. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have more folks joining us as um, the panel goes on. Uh, welcome to the second of um, our Bill of Rights for Criminalized Workers and Communities uh, uh, webinar series. Um, this, this series comes from uh, the notion that systems of oppression are durable and that structural inequality is in, enmeshed in literally every institution within our society. And so th the notion behind the Bill of Rights was, um, which was written by communities, uh, across, directly impacted communities across the US, was that our, our mission is not just to de decarcerate, but to create real structural change in the communities that have been most harmed and most criminalized um, in, in this current form of oppression that is mass criminalization. And to do so, we can't focus on just one issue because uh, we know that structural inequality is something that is profoundly interconnected, whether that be um, around housing, whether that be around the right to mental health care, whether that be around um, access to education, and um, all, also what this topic is, the, the right to a living wage. And um, until we begin to undo and eradicate those structural inequalities, we're not going to actually be free. And so um, uh, we have a pretty amazing panel for you today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them really quickly and then uh, we're going to have a short video and then, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel to um, wow you since they, they are more than, they are going to do that more than I am. Anyhow, um, uh, our panel today is Mia Walker. She's the criminal justice manager at Forward Justice, which is based out of Durham, North Carolina. Um, Doug Smith, who's the senior policy analyst at the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, um, obviously based out of Texas. Um, Fred Ordonez, who is uh, the executive director of DARE, which is not to be confused with um, the police program, but direct action for rights and equality, and they're based out of Providence, Rhode Island. And our illustrious um, moderator for today is Andrea James. Um, she is the founder and executive director of Families for Justice as Healing and the founder of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. I did that well. Um, that's a long one. Um, so uh, thank you all to the panel um, and for taking time for us to do this. And uh, without further ado, uh, let me just show you guys a, a short video. So far, I submitted 78 resumes, and I haven't gotten a couple of calls back from video. It's difficult because you come out of jail and you're still locked up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you try to do on a legal basis. You can't get rid of the stigma of being a, a convict ever. I call that the second question. While I was on the plate, I took it down to a vocational program to get back and got uh, certified as well. So I would go to all of these different places with my health licenses and certifications and say, it all behind but they come from all the public that I am in who I can hope. Um job applications, death for job applications and not being called or thought of because of my background. I had to call once that you gotta hire me uh to get the PCI while record. So I went as well. I got the PCI. Uh, he called me back a half an hour and said we can't hire you. So I'm trying to deal with the that 
got that far in the door. Megan, can you turn up the video? It's very hard to hear the video, Megan. Oh. I don't think, and I think people are. Uh, I went to school at New England Tech for administrative medical assistance, and halfway through the course, they came and told me that I wouldn't be able to practice in the field in which I was studying. Uh, but they took my loan, and I stole all these loans today. I got an education, and it's still hard for me to find a job. So I got a bachelor's degree in community and organizational development. However, you have your preliminary uh, licenses that you have to go for. Um, because of my criminal background, I'm not allowed to. So $35,000 in a college education into a field I can't go anywhere with. It makes you almost want to give up at times. Um, luckily, I'm a fighter, and I don't give up very easy. <laughs> <laughs> The laws need to be changed. To have a right to get a job, it's like they come out and they don't have anywhere to begin because all odds are against them. We won't be able to support our families, our communities, our neighborhoods. I made a promise to my little boy that there would never be a time in his life that I would not be available to him. So thank you folks. I'm um, sorry. I my husband had told me to take my headphones out of my computer when I was showing the video and I totally forgot to do that. Um, that being said, uh, uh, I wanted to present that video as, as sort of an opening for this conversation and a, a way to sort of think about um, how we move towards a living wage. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea. I, I, thanks, Megan. And I just, you know, I too, I, it was the first time that I was getting a chance to see the video and it was real, it, it looked really interesting. And a lot of people were asking if we could start it over. And I'm not sure what the time frame is for, for considering that, but is there some place that folks would be, will be able to see that again? I, I'd like to see it in its entirety as well. Megan. Okay. All right. Can folks hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. We're just going to jump in for folks who are listening and who have asked to uh, see that and hear that video again. I will advocate aggressively for that. <laughs> I'd like to see it again also. So uh, we're here and I want to thank everybody for being here uh, with us. Um, uh, David and Fred, I'm, I'm sorry, Mia and Fred and Doug um, for this really um, uh, necessary conversation about um, the right to work, but not so much that also the right to work, but also the right to uh, receive. Thank you, David. He's saying everybody, uh, David will send it out. So we will get a chance to see that, but also the right to earn a, a dignified, sustainable living wage uh, where well, we can care for our families. And as we know, there are more than 34 million working households in the United States that live um, above the official poverty line and still do not earn enough to cover the cost of paying ordinary expenses. And when uh, this problem is exacerbated greatly for the more than 70 million people with a criminal record. And so there's a, there's a lot of work that's being done around this issue by people who are directly affected by formal incarcerated people to say that we deserve the right to be able to feed our families, to care for our families. And so um, I, I just wanted to jump in there and ask Fred if he could get us started thinking about the work that, that you're doing at DARE and um, how I think it's great to start with you because you really help us to frame this and show the intersectionality of these issues that um, we need to be paying attention to. Can you talk a little bit about what you're focusing on at DARE? Sure, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so our organization is 33 years old. It's a member-led organization, and we focus our recruitment in low-income communities of color. And so the members of our organization decide what we work on, and it's there's no short of it issues. It's 360 degrees worth of issues. Um, we do have a committee that focuses more on the uh, criminal justice system. So we, and it's, we have a committee called Behind the Walls and through that committee we've done voting rights um, 
inside things like commissary prices or phone calls. Uh, we're still working on solitary confinement. We've had some victories and losses on probation violations. We passed ban the box for both state and pub private jobs on shackling pregnant prisoners. Um, we did what uh, New Orleans did not, not too long ago with our city's housing authority and changed our policies for admissions. Um, and we're working right now on occupational licenses um, that uh, Megan's group is also work, helping us with. We're also supporting our, our allies who are working on marijuana legalization, decriminalizing certain things at a municipal level that, is, that the police are targeting homeless folks with. Um, Re-establishing uh, an, ex an external review um, authority uh, of police in the city it's called PARA, Providence External Review Authority. Um, we passed, recently worked to pass a city ordinance on police accountability and we're following up on those things. We're part of a coalition called a MORE Alliance to Mobilize Our Resistance because we realize um, in these times we need more than just policy victories. So a MORE is a coalition of groups that decided to start building um, resources for folks who were brutalized by police and or jacked up by ICE. So legal support, community support, transportation, everything that, that folks will need. And we have a hotline that folks can call. Um, we're working also with other folks who are working on fines and fees and also changing possession from a, from a felony to a misdemeanor. But this is all within sort of the scope that folks are used to working in the, the way that we see our work, though, is not just about uh, these short victories. We have a vision of abolition, and, our and you know, most of our work has to do with political education, movement building, um, and supporting other issues, and folks understanding the root causes of problems. And but we have these shorter reform uh, fights so that people just learn sort of how to have victories, how to how to change immediate problems. And beyond the sort of the criminalization stuff. Um, we're also in spaces that have to do with economic and housing development because we can stop these sort of terrible things, but um, uh, here in Rhode Island, we have um, uh, at the city level and the state level departments that all they do is focus on economic and housing development, and they have staffs of hundreds that get paid over $100,000 each that, um, you know, worked all year long to on supposed economic development and housing development, and they could just come up with you know ways to make wealthy people wealthier, and this whole trickle down economic theory. And so we're inside those fights too. Um, so when there's ever a tax stabilization agreement that happens on the city level, where they're saying, look, you need to have goals to hire folks with criminal records. You definitely can't have um, prohibition of anybody with criminal records. Mm -hmm. And we're also at a state level saying. Look, towns and cities across the state need to have, do their 10% affordable housing. We're also fighting things about um, voucher, uh, you know, um, income, some source of income. Folks are discriminating um, around the state, not letting folks uh, rent if they have a voucher, a Section 8 voucher. Also, we're, we fight for these, when they have these projects or when they have these development, big development projects, to include um, uh, not only uh, well, community benefit agreements that help our folks. So hiring, you know, tar targeted hiring to have goals and also um, and things like linkage fees, which means instead of when, when you're not building housing or affordable housing, you pay into a fund that is going to go to, to building low income housing or vouchers for folks with criminal records. Okay, also kinda, I want to dive a little bit more deeper into a lot of the things that you brought up. I want to ask Mia just for a moment, just so we can get in some, a, a couple of, uh, uh, more introductions in terms of the work that you're doing around addressing the profound inequalities with the um, and and how that is linked to our work. Can you talk a little bit about that, Mia, about the work that you guys are doing over in Durham? Sure. So we have several bodies of work. I'm just going to highlight just a couple and we can um, dive deeper into those later. But the big one that we've been working on recently is our community um, justice in, uh, reinvestment initiative. And that is the um, the thing that we really are wanting to target Department of Public Safety um, in terms of the monies that they have saved in terms of reinvesting. So instead of pocketing that money into their pockets and hiring more probation officers and staff, we are really holding them accountable to the $8 million that they have saved to actually put that back into the communities that have been most directly impacted. So Daryl and I are the leads of those projects. We have been, we actually just had our first 
um, JRI uh, investment hearing in the Triangle, and we're ho hosting five across the state. The goal really is to listen to those who have been most impacted, including their families and loved ones, about the cost, the fines and fees that have been attached to them as they went through the criminal justice process and are still problematic when they're returning home. Um, the other part is we are working with the Trans Transformative Justice League. Uh, we're working with Harm Free Zone and we're specifically working with mothers um, who are living in public housing, wanting to make sure that they have not only adequate housing, but be able to be able to build um, in terms of building power and being able to really connect and, and work with their kids to make sure that they have a truly um, authentic living way of life. Uh, the other part I'm sure many of you have heard is our Poor People's Campaign, which is a national call for moral revival. Uh, we're also working with the NAACP on the Together Our Moral Movement. But one of our big projects, which is for our attorneys, is the Dante Sharp wrong, Wrongful Conviction. And um, both Daryl and Caitlin have been working on, on those projects as well. Thank you. Great. And Doug Smith, hey, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to you uh, 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 about a week ago when we had our first conversation and really talking about um, this uh, false narrative about formerly incarcerated people and directly affected people in terms of unemployment and the rates of unemployment and how that plays out and in, 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 in again, stereotyping us in a bad way as, as opposed to focusing on the fact of all of the incredible barriers that are put in place of formerly incarcerated people to earn dignified uh, wages. One of them has to do with um, a lot of the barriers that are, that are placed as a result of licensing boards mm -hmm. and that disconnect between licensing boards and the community. Can you talk a little bit about that, Doug? Absolutely, yeah, so we, we started uh, over the summer looking at uh, the extent to which occupational licensing barriers really do pose uh, a, a real boundary to people joining the workforce, actually accessing higher wage jobs. And, you know, it was interesting. We, uh, we tried several different policy approaches and what we kept on hearing from uh, folks in the community, what we heard from uh, in when I say folks in the community, I mean occupational licensing schools and uh, licensing boards themselves is that Texas is sort of a, a step ahead in, in a lot of respects. We've got a licensing code that actually uh, requires people to consider uh, mitigating circumstances, um, evidence of rehabilitation and so on. And, and that if you look at the rate of denials, what you'll find is that they deny a considerably lower number of people uh, who have criminal records. And none of that sounded true. <laughs> and what we, uh, and so we had to drill a little bit deeper. And so we went through a legislative office because it's really hard to get data. I think that's one of the, uh, one of the big barriers is that you know, the general public has to navigate through many too many hoops, oftentimes go through the attorney general's office to get real data to understand what's going on. And so we went through a legislative office and I'm actually sitting in her closet, the legislator's closet here. So that's what you see behind me. I'm depriving them of their refrigerator right now. Um, and, you know, we, we asked not only for denials, we asked for uh, every instance where someone asked for a criminal history evaluation letter. That is to say, a, they asked the licensing board to determine whether or not they would even be eligible to apply. And we realized very few people had asked it and we received reams and reams, the years of data that indicated that the problem was far worse than we ever imagined. We learned that people trying to get into the nursing professions, you could have a 20 year old burglary charge. You could have a, tw uh, we've, I'm looking at my data right now. We've got a 1993 conviction for criminal mischief with property loss of $200 and that person was deprived the opportunity to become a nurse. And so it was really insidious. And what we realized is that that is not the narrative that licensing boards are telling uh, legislators. What they're telling legislators is we don't deny very many people. And uh, schools that offer these professions uh, aren't really aware of it because it's become so institutionalized when people uh, come with criminal records wanting to go become a vocational nurse or, or to get into one of the high demand technological 
uh, professions, what they're told right on the front end is you need not apply because we've already heard from countless applicants that they've been determined to be ineligible. So every time that you tell someone that they're ineligible based on some sort of really minor charge or even uh, a more serious charge that's decades old, you're telling hundreds, if not thousands of people you need not apply. And so it's ingrained within our stru system, these structural inequalities. You know, um, we also have to deal with the high rate of denial of this, of even the opportunity to apply. And we're coming into this also with this heavy, heavy burden that folks have touched upon in their introductions around the fines and fees. And I think everybody pretty much around the table is doing some sort of work around that. Mia, can you uh, talk a little bit about that issue um, sure. and how is that affecting the right uh, of, of formerly incarcerated people to earn sustainable and dignified ways to, to feed their families? So just recently a report came out and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up that um, we have been doing research around fines and fees has been a, a, good, a great part of our work. Um, so for North Carolina, our fees have increased over 400% over the past 20 years. Um, we have like one judge in Wake County that is incredibly, um, um, he's incredibly conservative, but he's also very passionate about really wanting to work on re restoration. And so he has been co um, consistent in like waiving all of the fines and fees. But then we have other judges who are really looking for a punitive approach to just keep imposing debt, which makes it in impossible for our people to live. So one of the things that we were doing as a part of our body of work is um, the governor, uh, Governor Cooper, who um, just came into office over a year ago, was very passionate about wanting to campaign off reentry, right? And actually, I would tell you, he was campaigning off of the backs of black and brown people. Um, but the goal was, is he wanted to create this uh, comprehensive reentry plan um, that would allow for our people to really be successful as they're returning home. So one of the things that um, he was working on is really wanting to, so we had very, let me break, uh, back up. We had 10 working groups and they ranged from like advocacy to fines and fees to women in incarceration to mental health to transportation, anything that you can think of that impact our people. But one of the things that we were looking at is an opportunity to amend expansion and certificates of relief statutes to allow greater access to relief. So what that looked like is for anybody who had multiple convictions for misdemeanor and up to three convictions for a class H and I felony offenses, um, we were going to make them eligible for certificate of relief. The other part that I learned is that in North Carolina, like our DMV, they were both the license of drivers who were convicted um, for failure to appear or just failure to pay the associated fines and fees. So these are people that when they pay all their fines and fees with the initial violation of a service fee of $50, um, for those who neglect to return their license to DMV in time, they have to pay a $65 restoration fee. Um, and beginning in 2018, drivers must request a new hearing and pay a new fee in full before the hearings takes place. And roughly this is 6% of drivers regained their license last year, 6%. So the impact is huge. We are really criminalizing people who are living in poverty. And not only that, you're criminalizing black and brown people. I'll actually speak from my personal experience. So it was around 20, I wanna say 2016. I knew that my time was up to get off probation and parole. Um, and we had both of those uh, in, in North Carolina. And so I had to go before a judge. The judge that was there was extremely racist and he didn't care that I had a degree. He didn't care that I was working. He didn't care that all the things I accomplished. He literally sat there and just obliterated me in like five seconds. I don't care what you're doing. You harmed the victim. My, my uh, crime was an embezzlement crime. And it was always like, I'm looking towards this woman who has been violated and I don't care of all the great things that you have done to be successful coming out, I'm still gonna punish you. I ended up having to hire an attorney. The attorney was really great and he actually um, didn't charge me anything. But the only thing that saved me is the fact that when I was originally sentenced, there was a statement in there that says, as long as she has been in compliance with all of her fines and fees and hasn't missed any payment, she's free to go. The difference in that is that I started out at $100 and then when I went back and when my probation officer took me back to court, the judge that was there just because, didn't matter again of all the things that I had done, raised it from $100 to $750. So over the course of six years, I paid that amount. 
The only thing that saved me is the fact that it stated that if she continues to make her payments in five years, she'll be free and clear to go. So, but again, this is my story and it's not just me. This is people that have been impacted who are living in property. We're talking about, you know, not just fines and fees that are attached to your sentence. This is somebody that is, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, DMV, we're looking at other uh, uh, barriers that prevent our people from fully living up a full life. Like when we're talking about licensing boards. And so our role moving forward is we really want to target those things. We're actually meeting, we're scheduling meetings um, in the next couple of weeks to be able to sit down with the licensing board people and to be able to hopefully be able to change the conversation and have them to actually sit and have a conversation with directly impacted people so they understand like, yes, this thing happened to us, but it's not the defining moment. And we have a right to have a job. We have a right to have a full life. We have a right to be able to raise our kids and we have a right to really to have full equality and everything restored. Thank you, Mia. Um, Fred, I want to get you, you guys are doing a lot of really great direct, direct action around rights and equality and public housing, as you mentioned, occupational license again, and the cultural and educational uh, work that you guys are doing. But one thing that you're also doing, which we always want to make sure that we are connecting all the time to whatever campaigns or issues we're discussing, are our brothers and sisters who are still inside. And you guys are working directly with a committee behind the walls. Is that the name of it or just a committee behind the walls? Can you talk a little bit about that to address the cost of things that are affecting families inside as well as uh, 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 their, the, their loved ones who are also burdened with the cost of things to support them on the outside? Yeah, <clears throat> so the behind the walls committee is our committee at DARE. Um, which is a formerly incarcerated folks and family members. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, we, we have a base of folks inside too that we communicate through letters with and we have a newsletter that goes out to them. Um, and over the years, we've done some stuff on the inside, uh, but we do more stuff that, you know, to, that's causing people to go in to begin with. And then once they come out, like barriers that they have, the, um, we did do a, you know, this thing about costs and what it costs people. We, we have been, so there was a, we were part of a national um, report called Who Pays? Mm -hmm. uh, Baker. Yeah, yeah. Baker. Yeah, we were one of the yes. people who did that. And uh, so, you know, this issue of uh, the cost is put on, the burden is put on folks. I mean, I've been, I've experienced that myself when I was younger. And every time I'm in court, you know, you see judges give homeless people fines, which is ridiculous. It's like, what, how are they going to? come up with the money, you know, they don't understand these things in the name of safety are making everybody less safe. Um, and yeah, so we we're supporting the local fines and fees campaign. We're not leading that an ally of ours is, but uh, we, everybody in our, in our group um, completely understands it. Can we, let's, let's shift around a little bit. And now that we've talked about what the problems are, Let's talk a little bit. Doug, can we start with you to talk about how do we disrupt industries that are leaving us out? How do we, be, how do we begin to take all of these things that we're recognizing as issues um, and begin uh, to work collectively toward disrupting this? Well, I can certainly talk about what we're doing on occupational licensing. And I think that kind of gets to your question, I think. You know, one of the things that we've learned is that uh, we've got about 36 licensing boards in Texas, um, covering hundreds and hundreds of professions. And so even with our largest uh, licensing board, which uh, regulates 41 professions, that they're heavily reliant on the industry itself. And so they will ask, say, the barbers or the uh, electricians to uh, create sort of an advisory committee that uh, advises on which, uh, which individuals with criminal histories they might accept and which ones they wouldn't. And the department actually just goes along with what the industry says. And you start to learn that the industries themselves, that, that the licenses themselves are really intended to inhibit someone's ability to uh, access that profession and uh, and licensing boards just sort of go along with it. I think it's really important to just underscore that a lot of these, this isn't just uh, a um, an avenue for a living wage job, that what we're talking about with occupational licensing is an engine of our economy. We're when you talk about 
becoming a plumber or a professional engineer or an attorney, that these allow you to sort of hang a shingle and start your own small business. It allows you to hire people. It allows you to become an engine of economic growth for your community. And so the the businesses or the the uh, the occupations themselves are actually inhibiting people from doing it. I mean, uh, imagine in Texas that the our own prison system, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, has a narrow set of professions that they will train, but they won't provide any sort of certification for barbers because the barbers themselves don't want people with convictions becoming barbers, even though you could oh. serve. 17, 20 years inside of a prison facility cutting hair. <laughs> and it's absolutely something that you could do when you get out and actually start your own barber shop and become an engine of economic growth for your community. So yeah, the I think challenging it, first of all, is to uh, challenge their authority. Like uh, we, we need to clearly state that what directly, what offenses directly relate, excuse me, not offenses, you could, should say what directly relates to that occupation and it should be um, opening up someone's opportunity to engage in the same or similar criminal conduct and also providing more clarity about mitigating circumstances and and what constitutes rehabilitation we're going to require all licensing boards to not just tell someone they're ineligible but to say based on what we've seen, this is what you can do to improve your likelihood of getting accepted on your next round of application. So those are some few things that we're doing right there. And you raise a really excellent point, Doug, about um, occupational licensing. It's not just about getting a job. It's, it, it really impedes a person's ability to even start a business, which for us, as formerly incarcerated and convicted people, starting a business sometimes is the best route for us to go. That's and right. And you know, we recently um, at the National Council have been doing a lot of research around cooperative businesses and the long history, particularly in the African American community, community about how working collectively in cooperative worker owned businesses have helped marginalized and disenfranchised people over the years to really begin begin to get a foothold and to, to, to begin to, to, to uh, get some economic justice. Mia, in, in, in terms of that, you talked about the Community Justice Reinvestment Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, these are the things that those of us that are doing this work in our communities are trying to focus that money to yes. say, look, what are you guys spending this money on and what right. should we be spending it on? Tell us a little bit about what you guys are really fighting for in terms of those funds. So Daryl, before I started with Florida Justice, Daryl had been working on this, I think, for the, like, the past two years. And so when and you brought me on. Slow, just say that slowly so people, I, I'm not sure we introduce forward justice, right? Yes. So I just want to make sure everybody hears where, yes. where, where all this great work is coming out of. So it's coming from Forward Justice. And just briefly, we are a law policy strategy organization that's geared towards addressing economic and racial injustice. And so um, Daryl had been doing this work. He's an attorney. He's been doing this work for a long time. And so when he brought me on, he was like, sis, it's now time to hold DPS accountable to the monies that they save. And I was like, what do you mean monies? Because I had no idea. I know that what they were doing for um, anybody who was a, a part of the work release program. And so let me just give you a brief analysis of that for, this, for our state. Um, any of our people, whether it's male or female, that actually qualified for the work release program, you know, they would go to work on a job, they'd make money, but they would have, they were required to pay $400 a month to DPS. Now, it's not like they are living in a separate trailer. This is like, you know, they're, they're paying money. Um, in addition to the fact that they have no idea where this money is going, they only get a statement at the end at, at every month. And so we were like, and so for me, I was like, well, why wouldn't you just like invest that or save that for our sisters as they're walking out the door, right? So if they've you know, been there for two or three years and they're saving $400, like, you know, what would that be like? So they wouldn't have to struggle, specifically for women and kids. So when I was sharing that with Daryl, he was like, well, there's a much bigger issue. They have been saving money, calling it community reinvestment. But actually what was happening is that they were hiring either more probation officers, more staff, and um, creating more programs, so to speak, for our people that are incarcerated, but never was fulfilling the actual plan. And so currently, Daryl was like, we need to hold them accountable. So our first one, we had held our first um, reinvestment hearing, and it really was about, I was very intentional wanting to make sure not only was our sisters at that event, but making sure that the families and loved ones, because I think that they are so 
often being invisible, right? And so it was amazing. I mean, we had grandmothers in there. We had, you know, like not just moms, we had moms and their kids, but we had grandmothers in there who were saying, and some were crying, like, you know, this really impacted me because I had to absorb some of that cost when they came home. I had to help them when it was come for them to, you know, find a car. I had to help pay the criminal justice debt back in order for them to, you know, be able to pursue and live and to, and to be. Um, and so we were like, well, that's, you know, that's obviously wrong when you have this money sitting there. So our goal is to really write this intensive report. So from the first hearing to the next five that we will have, we're going to put all of that data into a report so that we can produce it to DPS and actually have this, our, our goal is to actually have a sit down with the governor. You know, you campaigned off free entry. This is what you said you wanted to see happen. You mentioned that you want all of our people to be free and have the ability to live and thrive. So therefore, here's the report. Here's the money. Give it to us. Bottom line. Great. That's fantastic. And, and that, and that, just so we're all clear on yes. community justice reinvestment money, yes. we're, we're talking about money that is uh, saved uh, by all of this community reinvestment, uh, re right. re this community, the, yep. the, the um, justice reinvestment acts yes. and all yes. of the work that is being done to yes. uh, cut down on the numbers of people that are going into prison, that are currently exactly. in prison. And so right. as we uh, shrink those numbers, supposedly, there is money that uh, is saved by the state for doing that. And then that money needs to be invested. But how it's being invested is the question. And we need right. to be aware of that because it can be used for things that help us thrive, right? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so um, back to you for a minute, Fred, just really quickly. Around public housing, your public housing campaign, um, when we don't have the ability to make, to, to, you know, make a living and to, to uh, feed and, and, and house our family, what is the work that you're doing around that to, to, to create that change? And how does it intersect with the right for a, a, a uh, fair and, 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 and sustainable wages. Yeah, so our folks are always housing and jobs, you know, when, when we are deciding what to affect, it's those, those are the two things that they always talk about. So direct, you know, to get people housing, there's different ways, there's ways of stopping discrimination that happens that people are trying to get into different housing or creating new vouchers that are designated for re-entry. That's, that's another way um, stopping the sort of stuff that happens to folks who are homeless and with jobs it's about getting those the government and these private companies that are getting tax breaks and subsidies to include uh, two things one is goals because the part of the problem is you can say you know in order to get this tax break you're gonna have a goal of hiring 25% of your workforce uh, from that are formerly incarcerated folks that's a goal and they could ignore it and the other thing that's difficult is, you know, the discrimination end of it is that uh, having a criminal record right now is not a protected class. So if it was a protected class, you could, you could do things around discrimination um, that, that you otherwise couldn't. So to get around that, one of the things that I mentioned um, before that um, can, can work is this thing called designated census tracts. Because what happens is you can't have, you can't say, um, uh, developer A, you have to have, you know, you have to hire 25% of your workforce has to be uh, black folks or Latino folks. You cannot do that. Um, but you can say 25% of your workforce has to be from designated census tracts. This is something that California is doing where they're able to um, take uh, formulas and say, okay, if you have this particular level of unemployment, this particular level of poverty, this particular level of uh, um, housing needs or whatever, stuff that the census tract, um, tracks. And you could actually, if you make those levels high enough, you will be able to just geographically um, uh, uh, parse out the, you know, the, the, the folks that are like, you know, neighborhoods that are like 90% folks of color, 60% folks of color. And so those things you can actually have language that says you have to have these things and these community benefits and these hiring, um, targeted hiring agreements. And so it's a way to get around the discrimination that sort of the, 
where you can't say that you can't name folks by race, but if you name them by these census tracts, you basically are capturing most folks who are because of you know concentrated poverty. Um, geographic locations are usually people of color, so that's another way that you can um, you know uh, get resources to folks that need it. Great. Um, I want to just raise one more issue before we open it up to questions. Um, there's a gig economy. Um, we see it that, that's on the rise. We see it particularly, I know here in Boston, we're dealing with, um, uh, you know, a, an incident that happened over a year ago where more literally overnight with no notice, more than 10,000 drivers who had been driving successfully, had high ratings in driving, who, who drove for digital uh, transportation companies. We're talking about Lyft and Uber. And that's just one little segment of the gig economy that's really rising around the country. Um, but yet we're still left out of that even. Um, even the ability to drive and they're increasing the look backs on um, drivers, uh, even drivers again who have driven for a year or more and they're coming out to get into the Lyfts or the Ubers and they're just you know, finding out that they've been terminated as drivers because uh, states uh, are increasing what's called a look back around that. But it's happening with a lot of other gig economies and it's very difficult to accept that because these aren't even um, situations where people are are directly engaging. There's not transfer of money. There's not all of these things that they hold against them. Um, and so how do you think that, or are, are any of you working in any area around addressing uh, the, the, these digital economies and how they're increasingly, as they're evolving um, and, and opening up brand new industries for people to make a very uh, sustainable revenue, but still leaving out of, uh, 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 those Is anybody working in that area at all? No. Nope. Okay. Well, that's no. an area we need to be looking at and concentrating <laughs> because thousands of our people are being literally kicked off uh, simply because of of uh, our, uh, you know our criminal records is and and um, there's a booming economy as a result of that. So I really want to, first of all, I want to thank everybody. This is such, as you can tell, it is such a difficult issue to just um, cover in a very brief webinar. Um, uh, but I think that everybody has really done a great job in, in doing what was possible for us this afternoon in raising awareness about the, the breadth of this issue, right? Mm -hmm. How large mm -hmm. this issue is and how many different angles that um, we could uh, approach this from and still not even begin to touch upon all the things that are affecting directly affected people around the right to uh, uh, have sustainable uh, wages and a right to earn. And so I'd like to just give an opportunity to open it up to folks who have questions. Are there any questions or even to our panelists, if there are things that I didn't um, create an opening for you to talk about. If you'd like to jump in now while we're waiting for questions, uh, please do so. So I want to briefly talk um, in terms of education. Um, when I was incarcerated, I was able to go to Wake Technical College for free. And then upon my release in 2012, um, they canceled that. And so recently, we just got the waiver reinstated. And the reason why I mentioned that is because for those of you that are on this call, um, and those of you that are the panelists, you know that education is, is like the aha moment for us. I know for me, I'll speak personally for me, it was just like an eye opening of this, this. I knew this thing was going to change my life. And so now we have an opportunity to be able to reinstate the waiver. So what does that mean? I mean, you said that you have an opportunity to go to school for free. But what I'm working on right now for the people that I do know that are interested in going to school is to um, create some type of funding for them to be able to get their books. Because as we know, books are really expensive and I'm sure books are more expensive now since I've been out of grad school. But that was the aha moment for me. It was a saving grace. I, I intentionally went on DPS website uh, when I was arrested because I wanted to know what was available to me. Um, and luckily, I was in a state that actually did that. Uh, but of course, as you know, like, you know, when different legislators and people come in, they change the game. And so they strip that away. But we were able to get that reinstated within the past couple of months. So I'm really excited about that initiative. And I'm hoping that we are able to be able to push that out, push that notification out to people that are currently incarcerated and they can have an opportunity to take advantage of it. That's great. Doug, you want to talk a little bit about anything that we left out? Um, 
On on kind of structural inequalities, I mean, I will just mention that uh, in addition to our occupational licensing work, we're doing work around uh, drug offenses, property offenses. We've, um, you know, we're about to release a report on um, the intersects of homelessness and criminal justice. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about it. I think that you know, what we're noticing is that there's a high rate of arrest among our uh, homeless population for everything from criminal trespass to uh, homeless ordinance violations on up to possession of a controlled substance. And, you know, as we've looked at it, we're realizing that we're not just looking at issues of lack of services over criminalization and so on. We're looking at massive structural inequalities um, the city where I live in, Austin, um, our uh, African American population has declined to 8% of the overall population, yet constitutes 48% of the homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. 48%. And uh, so heavily policed, heavily overcriminalized. And so we're pushing really hard on uh, different strategies. We're realizing that uh, some of the diversion strategies that we've tried in the past don't really touch on those structural inequalities. So we're looking at working within outside of those systems with, within community-based systems um, and looking to create grant funds to do something different. We can definitely talk about that, but uh, we realize that criminal justice reform is we, we need to be talking about structural inequalities, economic equal inequalities. Thank you. Thank Brad, you. Brad, Brad, Brad. What? Sorry. Right. Gonna, is that me? We're going we're gonna to leave just a few minutes because I think Megan has said that we are going to get a chance to see the video at the back end. Is that still what we're going to do, Megan? I'm not sure if she can hear me with... Megan, can you hear? No. Okay. Fred, do you want to close us out? Uh, sure, I could say a couple of things. Sorry, I, I'm I have, I'm having some technical difficulties over here. Um, okay. Let me just I have to I have to listen on my phone and speak into the microphone ah. on the computer. But um, okay, I just uh, wanted to um, before we open it up for questions, and I've gotten a couple. Um, I want to go back to what. Uh, Andrew was talking about with the gig economy. And while this panel is not focused on this, it's something we should be because what we're finding more and more over the course of, um, of a sort of what is happening across the country is that more and more fields are becoming precarious for all workers um, in that we have just-in-time scheduling, uh, which is terrible for people who have children or ha have other responsibilities where you get, as Starbucks gives you your schedule the week before. Um, we have the, the, the gig economies that create opportunity in some ways, but then also don't create pension plans or real benefits for the mm -hmm. folks who are engaged in them. And so the, the, the gig economy issue or in the precariousness of labor is something that's coming up for all workers and then even more for workers who have records. And, and so I want to just uh, encourage um, everybody who's participating in this panel and everybody who's on the webinar to really think about what, what, what we need to do, what, how we need to organize a struggle against the undermining of our labor. Because if, if we don't, the, 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 the tide will continue to create situations where people are exploited, where people are um, put in precarious situations where people are fired. Um, to give one example, and then I'll get off my um, soapbox, uh, when meeting with the uh, New York City Council of Labor, they told me 90% of the construction trades in, in uh, Brooklyn are non-union. And they said, do you wanna know why? So we can hire undocumented, so that 
they could hire undocumented people and people with records and there would be no recourse when they fired someone or someone got hurt. And so this is an issue that we need, we need to be prescient and we really need to be thinking about um, taking up. Uh, so and, and, and I, I'm the person who seems to get the questions. So I'm going to um, uh, read them out. Uh, it, the first question, and I think this is a, a great question, is anyone working on or doing research on increasing rate wages for people while incarcerated? Yes. Some states don't pay um, people who are imprisoned anything. It seems like an area where those who are working while in prison could actually earn a living wage. So, so we're, we're working on a, a piece of legislation right now. And of course, everything we do around legislation that affects our people on the inside, we do with our people on the inside. And that happens at a much more slower pace. It's a little bit of a snail's pace. We take the time to incorporate the thoughts and ideas of the people who the, the legislation, the proposed legislation is going to have the effect on them. And so um, we are working on uh, just that, on a bill uh, to use as a model um, with our sisters inside uh, that is demanding uh, fair wages for their labor. And there's plenty of reasons as we all know why. I mean, you know, and most of the sisters who are working on that particular uh, model legislation to share with their other sisters in other state prisons around the country. Um, here in Massachusetts, are, the majority of them are mothers. And they can give you a laundry list of reasons why it's important that uh, uh, currently incarcerated people receive a fair wage. We recently challenged, and, and, I, and I say challenged in a gentle way because these are my heroes. I cut my teeth at the Public Defender Agency and learned everything that I know from the folks over there. And they are, you know, the heroes at the Committee for Public Council Services here in Massachusetts. They do incredible, amazing work and um, are committed to, to being the frontline defenders of people in the court system. But, you know, they had to get a gentle reminder also that it, we can't order business cards for public defenders who work for uh, the State Public Defender Agency um, from uh, men in Norfolk State Prison who are making just pennies uh, an hour. Uh, we need to, um, you know, and people always say, well, isn't it great? Isn't it enough that the people inside actually just have an, you know, something to do and that they're learning how to print these things and that they have jobs? Well, you know, when, yeah, of course, when we were inside, yes, you know, if you got a job that you actually learned something or, or was uh, slightly interesting, you wanted to have that job. It has nothing to do with allowing people to exploit incarcerated people for their labor. And so we are working on that uh, model legislation and, and just, just always as all of our model stuff, it's not to say it is everything to everybody. We just use it as the, the floor uh, to hope that everybody else will take it and freely use it and add what they think needs to go in for their you know, particular uh, 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 space. So we are working on that. Could I, could I jump in here? I, so we're not working specifically on uh, trying to get folks wages inside Texas. Yep. And absolutely, I'm still here. Uh, I think that would be absolutely incredible. And I've heard some members talk about it. We have 145,900 people incarcerated in Texas prisons. We, there are zero wages. There's no air conditioning. There are cotton fields where people pick cotton. There are field squads where uh, people deal with snakes. It's a, it's an actual, I'm so sorry, I'm hearing someone dial. If somebody could mute their phone. Yeah, great. So it's really difficult and it's a difficult sell to ask a state legislator to consider wages for that number of people. What we are asking them to consider is a couple things. Uh, first of all, work release opportunities. We've got a 35% parole approval rate. So we've got a lot of people eligible for parole who are just sort of lingering there. We'd like to expand work release into living wage or into at least minimum wage jobs so people can start uh, banking and preparing for release. We're also working at uh, ensuring that people get parole credits 
for the work that they do inside so that they get earlier parole consideration um, based on their participation and work for rehabilitative programming. I just wanted to add this other piece that you just reminded me of, Doug, um, in regard to those huge numbers in states like Texas of incarcerated people. And we still feel as though, as prison abolitionists, that we will keep pushing for uh, livable wages, even for people in, who are incarcerated in huge numbers. Mm -hmm. but, but one of the other uh, ways that we're trying to uh, get, a, get, get an inroad here is also thinking about how can we uh, uh, create opportunities for incarcerated people to start businesses. We're not allowed to own a business while we are incarcerated. That's part of the research we've been doing around cooperative businesses, not only for those of us who are, have uh, 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 been allowed to come home, but also for our brothers and sisters who are still inside. This actually is happening in Puerto Rico. There is uh, brothers inside um, in the men's prison who have a business that they started and that they are supported by people on the outside, but the business is run by them inside of the prison. And so cooperative uh, worker-owned businesses, again, are something that could help to uh, create uh, more opportunity for dignified uh, revenue. And Doug speaks to the issue of what legislators keep pushing back and, and, and speaking about the numbers of vast numbers of people in places like Texas. But, you know, a lot of people can be worker owners in uh, prisons as well. Absolutely. I'll, tie, I'll say one other thing. When members come to me and ask for uh, how do we get people wages, which they do, members really do care about that. I say it's easy. You just decrease the prison population and that pays for it. And we give them countless examples of how you can do that. That's awesome. Which brings us back to me, all, all that work over there with Mia and, and the justice and <laughs> So we could right. So this is a big circle. <laughs> um, I know we're short on time. Megan, you want to jump in and help us? We up? are. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, we are coming to an end. I want to just really thank the panel and Andrea, Andrea for um, participating. This as folks uh, um, should know, this is a ten-part series. Um, so the next uh, panel will be moderated by Ms. Vivian Nixon, um, and it will be on the right to education featuring um, Victor Rios, who is, uh, has written several books about um, uh, school to, uh, the school to prison pipeline and the, the impact of being criminalized on black and brown boys. Um, the panel will also include Hakeem Crampton, who's our the Working Future Campaign's Michigan um, statewide organizer, who has been uh, instrumental in um, much of the work that we've done around um, juvenile justice and youth justice, and uh, and I'm I, and I'm missing somebody, but uh, we oh. Sorry, I got to go, guys. Bard Prison Initiative is going to be joining us to talk about um, some of the work that they've done um, around this issue. So I hope that you guys tune in uh, next week. And because uh, several people in the comments section asked for me to show the video again without keeping my headphones in um, so that they could hear it, we'll end with, with that um, now. Great. And... Thanks, everybody. I Bye. just have to find it again. Um, here we go, folks. Technology is not my favorite thing, people. So far, I submitted 78 resumes, and I haven't gotten a phone call back from any of them. It's difficult because we come out of jail and we're still locked up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you try to do on a legal basis. You can't get rid of the stigma of being a, a convict ever. I call that the silent punishment. Not being able to get a job, not having financial security, not being able to find a place to live. Thank you.
while I was in federal prison, I took advantage of vocational programs that they had, and I got um, certified in welding. So I would go to all of these different places with my welding licenses and certifications and say, you know, are you hiring? And they'd all be hiring, but the company policy was that they couldn't hire anyone who had anything open. Um, job applications after job applications and not being called or even, you know, I thought of because of my background. The guy at the car wash said, oh, I'm going to hire you. Um, we just need BCI for our records. So I, went, I was all happy. I went and got to BCI. And uh, he called me back a half an hour and said, well, we can't hire you. Sometimes, you know, you feel a little depressed that, you know, you got that far in the door, meaning you did get the interview, uh, they did like you, et cetera, and they thought that you were qualified, but then, you know, you have this stigma hanging over your head. I went to school at New England Tech for administrative medical assistance, and halfway through the course, they came and told me that I wouldn't be able to practice in the field in which I was studying. Uh, but they took my loan, and I still have all these loans today. I got an education, and it's still hard for me to find a job. So I got a bachelor's degree in community and organizational development. However, you have your preliminary uh, licenses that you have to go for. Um, because of my criminal background, I'm not allowed to. So $35,000 in a college education into a field I can't go anywhere with. It makes you almost want to give up at times. Um, luckily, I'm a fighter, and I don't give up very easy. <laughs> The laws need to be changed. To have a right to get a job, it's like they come out and they don't have anywhere to begin because all odds are against them. We won't be able to support our families, our communities, our neighborhoods. I made a promise to my little boy that there would never be a time in his life that I would not be available to him. So thanks, folks. Uh, that is that. That concludes the end of our webinar and. Um, we hope to see you next month. We'll be posting about a date and time later today. Thank you. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thank you.